Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. I think by now I owe you a couple of solo shows, actually. Um, this, one, this one is a little delayed for reasons pertaining to its potentially contentious title, <laughs> as a matter of fact, which is that spirit contact is easy. Now, I guess I'm kind of amusing myself, or it's a joke on myself, um, by titling this solo show, Spirit Contact, is easy because I have been sick for a month on account of planning a trip to the Amazon for the express purpose of Spirit Contact, which I just called easy. So, yes, little joke on myself. Um, releasing a show on the ease of Spirit Contact on the eve of me making it very hard for myself. And the, the unwellness has been in uh, large part due to the sort of um, vaccine schedule, frankly, and, uh, and the immunosuppressing impact that um, tends to have in the short term. So it's things you've got to do, obviously, um, before you're uh, heading off on an adventure. Adventure. And uh, it's it's an interesting kind of adventure. So if we're going to talk about spirit contact being easy, I'll start with it being hard because I'm not going. I'm not just going somewhere really remote. I'm going from somewhere really remote to somewhere else really remote. So um, in the in the process of getting ready, um, actually, when I went and got the prescription, and then I went to the pharmacy as you do to. Because uh, my clinic here at the edge of the world certainly doesn't carry things like yellow fever vaccines um, because we don't have much use or call for them, right? And I handed it in at the pharmacy and the woman behind the counter was like, oh my God, wait here. Um, the, the pharmacist will scream. And and obviously she's like the office cut up or something. So I'm like, okay, um, I'll wait. I wasn't sure if she was serious, but she was. She went right around the back and there's the pharmacist, you know, you've been to a pharmacy, you know how they, they're they putting all the drugs and, and filling their prescriptions, right? And she handed it to her and kind of stood back. And the, um, the pharmacist opened up my prescription and looked at it and went, ah! Um, I said, oh my God. And, uh, and me and the other woman um, laughed. So yeah, it was quite the... Uh, it's been quite the ordeal getting all of that sort of stuff ready because this is somewhere remote, going somewhere else re um, remote. So one of them, I basically had to medi transport myself um, in one of the pharmacy fro like uh, they're essentially just a a chiller, right? Like a, a polystyrene chiller with cold packs in it, but it was sort of like an official medi transport one, and even that didn't work because um, we hit because the roads are dodgy as well. So we got a massive flat tire. <laughs> transporting a vaccine that has to remain below whatever it was, three or four degrees Celsius. So it's been like uh, a crazy uh, preparatory, I guess, experience um, so far. But it's also kind of, as is the way with these things, folded into the Q2 um, premium member experiment um, because it's triggered some extremely unusual and, and ultimately useful dreams. Uh, and there'll be more on that or the significance of that as we go through the episode. And depending on when the premium members are listening to this, there's another um, video update for the mansion game, which will dovetail with this episode. But the other thing that's happened that's sort of folded into it, uh, I've been busy with uh, permaculture Tasmania duties uh, as well. So, for instance, David Holmgren, who's the co-originator, he's been on the show, co-originator of permaculture, is down here uh, on a sort of combined holiday slash lecture tour um, for Retro Suburbia. And he's got this, um, he's got like a hypothetical 70-year street um, called Aussie Street, uh, which details, and it's, it's kind of really fascinating for people who are interested in place, um, the sort of 
essentially like the boom and bust and transformation over generations following World War II in a, in a kind of classic suburban context of how many people live there, who grows what, and, and kind of moving that into the next 15 years of how many of the people who listen to the show would be interested in living and, and, and shared resources and, and, and different techniques of, of um, reducing expenditure and, and energy use and, and all that kind of stuff, right? So I've seen it twice now because I'm the events officer. So I did the setup for the event in Launceston, which is the sort of um, second city in Tasmania. For those who don't know, it's at the top of the island and I live at the bottom of the island, right? Uh, so I've heard it twice. Uh, last night's was in Hobart, which is the capital. And uh, as a result, I didn't have to pay quite so much attention last night. And, uh, and it's been really interesting to go through. I mean, he's sort of one of the leading thinkers in this space, right? And it's really interesting to go through the Aussie Street presentation again, sort of knowing what's coming, because uh, I've seen it before, with a more than human frame of uh, understanding. So when you are dealing with um, something, we're going to talk about Professor Ingold again um, with some readings later in this episode, but that idea of pivoting from or understanding that humans don't make homes, it, what happens when you think about it as habitat and actually multi-species flourishing habitat, because you all, well, most of you, I presume, live in some form of structure you would consider a home, and you aren't the only one in it. And I mean, like, spiders, I don't mean pets, I mean spiders and microorganisms and, and, and plants and so on. You are actually, you are literally building habitat. And it's very interesting coming at it from that sort of animist epistemological angle. Uh, and it was fascinating to sort of watch what David's talking about and how it lines up with the things that we're interested in here without him actually using those terms, because, you know, why would he? Um, so those are the sort of two reasons for the delay. You'll notice it's not Thursday. It is, it's Sunday afternoon in Tasmania. I don't know when you're going to listen. Uh, and uh, that's, so there's the illness and the extreme being busyness, right? And it's the sort of busy uh, that you kind of have to planetary hour your life, if that makes sense. Uh, and I don't just mean using the planetary hours, although invariably I do it if I can. Um, it's more like you just deal with the, the thing that is right in front of you and completely ignore everything else until its turn comes around. So, um, for example, like obviously the permaculture Tasmania stuff, if you go David Holmgren, Holmgren in town, that's what took up the last couple of days and nothing else, right? Um, and an example would be this solar show. It's happening on a Sunday because I also need to test out my new audio recorder uh, and check the batteries and so on because I'm taking it with me. And so I'm packing to leave today. So that's when this happens, right? Uh, and so if those are the kind of reasons for um, the delays and what's been going on and how it sort of slowly folds into this notion of spirit contact being easy, even though I'm apparently making it very difficult for myself. Um, but I do want to talk about that. I, I think it's, this will be, I'm intending for this to be a good companion to, um, I guess, the second most recent, or also the Mushroom one, but like the last two solo shows as well. We're sort of picking up on, on a theme. Um, whenever I put these ones out, that's either about spirit contact or whatever. Um, they're invariably very popular and they get a lot of feedback. So that's what I'm doing. We're kind of continuing on that journey. And in this case, I'm going to reference a few recent guests who are toiling in a similar vineyard. So this is um, a, a quotation from Transcendent Wisdom of the Maya, because we had Gabriella on a few weeks ago now. And you'll get how it kind of aligns with what I was talking about, even with planetary hours. But let's we'll just start with this quotation, because we're going to move into spirit contact being easy, right? While we pleased the numinous beings with exquisite fragrances and counted the days and sacrifice to them, we received messages. The message can come through in thoughts or signs, sometimes literally as writing on the wall. A real animal may appear unexpectedly in some real or bizarre situation, or it may be supersized. More commonly, it appears in dreams. All these situations carry certain meanings. To Westerners, it may seem like superstition, but to an experienced daykeeper, it is a form of nonverbal language. For example, when an owl appears, something bad is about to happen in the family. To the Maya, animals have meaning beyond their mere physical existence. They carry symbols, and with those symbols come messages. There is no division between a real animal and his appearance in another form of being. Now, I don't think that, this is me, that's the end of the quotation. <clears throat> I don't think that's 
That last sentence is particularly well written, and I'd quibble with the use of real if both forms are real. So there's no division between a real animal and its appearance in another form of being. Uh, we'll follow up on that because that's actually the majority topic of, of, um, of this show, in fact. Uh, we'll follow up on that no difference between inner and outer experience shortly. I know what Gabrielle is getting at, which is essentially the the physical form of an animal observed in the quote-unquote wild and the dream form of an animal encountered in your sleep is the same thing. Um, expressions of a same thing, right? Um, but there's still a bit more to say about the ease of spirit contact before we get into it. Um, but basically, if you start thinking with the notion of dreams in a decolonized way, uh, and bear in mind, we we haven't got any form of cognition right in the West. We all know that here. Like it's it, our materialist versions of it are a toilet. Um, but if you start thinking with the notion of dreams in a decolonized way, you're already in a spirit contact is easy milieu because that's sort of, <laughs> you spend a third of your life, you know, literally interacting with it in, in viewed in that way, right? So two things as we move into the ease. Uh, uh, when we talk about this in the magical world, uh, Western magical world, um, late capitalist Western magical world, a lot of it is discussed transactionally, um, which I'm not completely behind. Um, I don't think that's the beginning and end of the discussion, and it does seem to begin and end there, which is if you want things from spirits, you should be giving them things and giving them things before you need things. Um, sure. I think it's more interesting than that, though. So if you are, if if as the last couple of episodes did, this sort of sparks discussion and 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 sharing of perspectives, don't begin and end um, with it there. And, and this is especially if why I use the word decolonized rather than um, animist or jailbroken, because to decolonize is to decapitalize, and we do default to prioritizing the transactional. Not to say it's not that isn't a correct statement; it's just not a good enough statement, right? And on that, the other bugbear, and we've the premium members have been through this a couple of times, uh, most notably, I guess, with the Grimoire course the other year. Um, legitimate is not the same as equivalent. And this is most apparent for people, the majority of people coming from a quote-unquote Western background who listen to this, in the difference between, say, a Solomonic approach and, um, and other forms of spirit contact, such as the ones that Gabriella was just talking about. Although, you know, don't get, like, daykeepers are no slouches. There's, there's precision involved in that, or you've made shit as well. The fact that you can and regularly do encounter spirits in your dreams, which is like you are literally lying down. Um, it's not much of an exertion, right? That's legitimate. It is not. So legitimate is a different idea to equivalent, because that doesn't, mean that you can throw away the up all night, getting the tools and the timing right, um, shouting and barking a spirit into a triangle. Um, you can't go, oh, because I dream of it. You can't tell me on a, you know, Saturday morning that you had a, a dream encounter with Boone or Astaroth on a Friday night. And that is, the, that is an equivalent of, of a Solomonic invocation or evocation in that case. Um, it's not equivalent. And that, in, even if it happened, <laughs> uh, and if you are pacted with some of them, then it does happen. But even if it happened, legitimate and equivalent are not the same thing. And I notice, and it is, it is particularly with grimoires, that because you can look across the world to, quote unquote, non-Western um, methods of interaction that emerge with different spirits in different contexts, that you can kind of do, oh, well, I'll just half ass it and... Yeah, I, I drew this. I drew the seal on on a piece of bread, and and I got drunk and ate the bread, and and that was the. It's like it's it's not. So, those two things when we're talking about spirit contact being easy, it is. However, there are forms of it that aren't, <laughs> uh, and that seems probably because most people who talk about this stuff on the internet don't do it as much as they like to think they do. Um, these two things, it being an overly transactional discussion and legitimate not being the same as equivalent, um, I see that everywhere when, when it kind of comes up, when, when you get the blizzard of hot takes after trying to have a, a decent discussion. Um, so I just wanted to drop them in there as we move from what Gabriella was saying or is saying about 
the um, the physical and dream form of an animal as just an example because it's the same for whatever um, being the same or different categories of the same real I suppose right one of the things that uh, I found fascinating that's been a thread over several recent guests and one neighbor uh, is the asking so Gabriella a couple of times in the book and it didn't come out as well in the discussion I, maybe I should have pre briefed her beforehand it was a great chat but I was very interested a few times. In it, she says, listen, when you're living with the Maya, it, you don't get that they'll just ask spirits for things that they have interactions with, and, and essentially miracles will occur. Uh, and she's talking particularly about um, day keepers and, and spirits of, of days and so on. Uh, and she says that you wouldn't, if you haven't encountered it, you don't realize that it's, 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 not, it's not exertive. And I was talking to Avalon, my neighbor, who's also been on the show, of course, um, about this uh, and how um, how she approaches spirits, coming having been you know raised in Brazil and that kind of stuff. And her observation was people often expect spirit interaction to look very Hollywood, and it very often doesn't. Again, legitimate equivalent. Remember that. Um, but when you get it when you get it right, the effects are very Hollywood. Now that that was an interesting way of, of looking at it because what Dr. Daniel Four said. Um, either on the show or in Melbourne, just as an aside, um, one of his observations being in ceremony with First Nations people um, once was that they were asking for, they were asking their ancestral spirits for stuff that was really like miraculous, really big things. And they were just asking for it normally because these are things that ancestral spirits do. And, um, and that's what I mean by spirit contact is easy if you get it right. Um, and you are, you're, you're approaching it from the right context. And you see, that's why I wanted to, um, foreground those statements with um, just highlighting. Let's not only have this as a transactional discussion, because obviously the the implications are there, but it's it's bigger than that. It's it's more. It's there's an there's an ontological uh, there's ontological medicine in spirit contact is easy as a wider idea rather than well, I, I will do regular spirit practice, and then when I ask for something like a new car, I'm, I'm more likely to get it. Like, that's a bit dull. It seems more interesting <laughs> to, um, to be, uh, yeah, m more ontological, I guess, about it. And this, of course, um, slides back into someone who we talk about eh, semi-frequently, I suppose, um, Ernesto Di Martino and the observation that cultures that have a belief in spirits get more extreme spirit effects, right? And that certainly happens on a culture-wide basis as far as we can observe. But it also happens on an individual basis when you start to do things like, um, you know, whatever it happens to be, like um, observing the, the rulers of the day and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it works on a micro as well as macro level. And so and because this is a chaos magic show, we're going to talk about that from a model perspective. But before we get to it, I just want to table a few more adjacent pieces to a spirit contact is easy ontological or ontology, I guess. We'll just leave it at ontology. We'll, we'll noun that. And one of them, again, recent guest, Elizabeth Crone, um, her description of after immediately being struck by lightning. It, her essentially not noticing that she was a spirit at that point in time um, and that it's actually easy to be one. And she transitioned into that state more or less without noticing. So that's an adjacent data point of um, how often, in this case, the spirit of a human, how often they're around you, even if you're not noticing them. Um, another one, and this is sort of, this gets to, I guess, depending on where you are in your um, interest in things like magic, because the show has people who listen to it for wider interest. Um, we talk about, when we're talking about spirit contact stuff, in inevitably, because it's human nature, the good stuff, right? Like, um, yeah, contact with deceased relatives and all that kind of healing and, and good things. There is, of course, the other side of it, if that is true, which is the negative spirit attachment. So, uh, and if you look at how... Now, I'll describe it this way, right? Um, And this is contentious. Maybe I should have put this up there with the, um, the legitimate equivalent and transactional thing. Be many things that a materialist culture may diagnose as a mental health issue, and listen carefully, 
can be successfully treated from a uh, spirit ontology perspective. So just be careful. Listen, be careful you didn't hear what I didn't say there, right? Uh, because it has some necessary implications um, if you are, and I know the majority of people who end up in magic are in some way broken, myself included. Um, so if this is a if this is a domain you have to personally have some expertise in because that's just how your life turned out, um, the implication is that you should at least try it. And I don't mean swap one for the other. See what happens from a symptomatic perspective if you... And it is honestly, if spirit contact is easy, you can ask healing spirits to um, clear you of negative spirit attachment that is, um, you know, responsible for your insomnia or mild depression or whatever it happens to be, right? Uh, that doesn't mean if you are getting treated in other ways for it, although eventually I would like everyone, you know, in theory, we seem to have forgotten this in the last 15 years. Uh, all forms of medication should not be... Ideally, they shouldn't be permanent. They, 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 they literally aren't that many chronic conditions compared to the amount of um, <laughs> people who are on regular, particularly in the US, regular prescription medication. So, like, in theory, obviously don't go off your meds, um, but in theory you should be looking for ways to minimize or get off them anyway because everything has side effects. So it's one of those things. Like, spirit contact is easy, and so from a negative spirit attachment, um, there is an implication there. And simply try it. This is where we get back to this being a chaos magic show. So there are several ways we can interpret or approach the trying, right? We can kind of go tired and wired. The tired approach is the spirit model yields better magical results than other models. And so that's the one I use sort of route. That's tired. And it's tired not because it's wrong, um, because it isn't wrong, um, but because if you start from modeling different modes of cognition, at, at least as we understand them in the colonized West, you're already too far downstream to be interesting to me. So you see what the, um, one of the challenges with the, the kind of like core chaos magic tech tech, which is a multi-model approach is that it's, it's uh, not, if it's not decolonized and it's kind of one of the reasons I wrote pieces of eight, um, it's too shallow. It's, it's still taken as a priori true that we are broadly correct in the West in our models of cognition, and that's not good enough. Um, if instead you base yourself in how you personally interrogate and formulate personhood, then the spirit approach is sort of unavoidable uh, because you're in an extended personhood uh, world that includes rosemary and gum trees and, and whatever. I'm just looking at my window now, right? Um, lavender and screeching birds and, and so on as persons. So you end up in a, in a spirit approach regard, uh, regardless, and that is the wired rather than tired way of doing this. Um, that said, it manifests as, you know, kind of experimenting with, with it as a ontology or belief system and it is if spirit contact is easy you can take that as a foundational premise just try things if you haven't done them before and i mean unnamed stuff you don't need to like um the the previous quarterly course was about had a lot to do with things like spirit guides and what even am they and are they parts of your mind and blah 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 right um, you don't even need the names of these things. You can talk about um, healing spirits or helping spirits and just try it. Just mentally call them in in, in that sense and, and see what happens. And that's the kind of chaos magic model. If you're, I mean, you guys, depending on where you are and, and you know, what sort of world you live in, you may be doing it anyway. But if you're not, honestly, give that a shot and, and experiment with it and, and consider... Because what will happen is that you'll be surprised at, it, at its efficacy. And then you will be in a situation of going, okay, well, how do I think with and process the fact that that worked, quote unquote, better than a, I don't know, whatever other model you've, you've been going with, like, a, like an extended idealist psychological one or something? I don't know. Because uh, you will kind of quickly get there. And, and if you, and the way to make that, I guess philosophically satisfying is not to sort of emerge from a, an assumed cognition model, but to emerge from a personhood model. Uh, and so we're going to kind of like talk about that as we move into dreams and persons and, and so on in the kind of extended reading part 
uh, of, I, I don't know if you know this, but I do all the solo shows as one take. So um, I've, I've written all this out for, for me to read. Um, so yes, if I stumble over some of the words, because I'm reading big chunks of academic text now, uh, that's what goes on. And this is, of course, Professor Ingold, and it's from an article called Dreaming of Dragons on the Imagination and Real Life. So I'm going to do big chunks of quotation, then I'll drop in with why we're talking about that, and, um, and then we'll finish it up, right? The dragon was not the objective cause of... Oh, yeah, so it opens talking about um, a particular monk's encounter with a dragon and what kind of real that is. Like, how do we think with that? This is... Absolutely on point. Okay. The dragon was not the objective cause of fear. It was the shape of fear itself. For the brethren of monastic communities, this shape would have been well known to all, drummed in through rigorous discipline of mind and body. In this training, stories and pictures of dragons and of other equally terrifying monsters were used not as we would today to create a comfort zone of safety and security by consigning everything that might be frightening to the realms of make-believe, but to instill fear in novices, so that they might experience it, recognize its manifestations, and, through a stern regime of mental and bodily exercise, overcome it. As the manifest form of a fundamental human feeling, the dragon was the palpable incarnation of what it meant to know fear. Thus, in medieval ontology, the dragon existed as fear exists, not as an exterior threat, but as an affliction instilled at the core of the sufferer's very being. Both saints and dragons, in the monastic imagination, were concocted from fragments of text and pictures shown to novices in the course of their instruction. In that sense, to adopt the apt term of historian Mary Carruthers, they were figmented. But these figments of the imagination, far from being cordoned off in a domain separate from that of real life, were for medieval thinkers the outward forms of visceral human experience lived in the space of rupture between heaven and hell. So we're going to move further into the dragon stuff. There's me talking now, clearly. Um, But you can kind of see I'm heading it in the direction of where Gabriella took that story of of animals being, um, in some sense, the same if they're encountered imaginally or externally, right? Um, So we're kind of heading in that direction. Back to Professor Ringgold. Let me introduce another example. Among the Ojibwa indigenous hunters and trappers of the Canadian North, there is said to be a bird whose sound, as it swoops across the sky, is a peal of thunder. Few have seen it, and those who have are credited with exceptional powers of revelatory vision. One such, according to the ethnographer A. Irving Hallowell, was a boy of about 12 years old. During a severe thunderstorm, Hallowell recounts, the boy ran out of his tent and saw a strange bird lying on the rocks. He ran back to call his parents, but by the time they arrived, the bird had disappeared. The bird, or the boy, was sure it was a pinesi, the thunderbird, but his elders were unconvinced. The matter was clinched, and the boy's account accepted, only when a man who had dreamed of the bird verified the boy's description. Clearly, Pinesi is, not, is no ordinary bird, just as the dragon is no ordinary reptile. Like the, th- the, the, like the sound of thunder itself, the thunderbird makes its presence felt not as an object of the natural world, but, more fundamentally, as a phenomenon of experience. It is the incarnate form of a sound that reverberates through the atmosphere and overwhelms the consciousness of all who hear it. Just as the monk's brethren, as they rushed outside, saw no dragon, so the boy's parents did not themselves witness Pinesi. But as a conventional shape of a powerful auditory sensation, it would have been entirely familiar to them. The thunderbird may be a figment of the imagination, but it is an imagination that has saturated the fullness of phenomenal experience. The philosopher uh, Gaston Bachelard has written eloquently of how the bird of our dreams, and that inhabits the realms of the poetic imagination, is not a thing of flesh and feathers, but a composition of air and movement in which the dreamer himself is borne aloft and carried along. The bird, says Bachelard, is the dynamic eye of the storm, its body the wind, its breath the tempest, and its wings the sky. 
For it to appear in its customary avian form, the dreamer must climb back up towards the day. Yet the apparition can only be momentary, or momentary, since the very climb causes it to be eclipsed as the quotidian boundary between seeing and dreaming is restored. Though Bachelard's sources are from Western literature, notably the visionary writings of William Blake, Ojiba people would have immediately understood the point, along with its corollary, namely, that the flesh and fle- feathers bird is but a manifestation of the real bird of the dreamstorm, rather than the other way around, and could not exist without it. Likewise, the fearsome dragon of Gregory's account uh, was the form of incandescent terror enveloping the subject, becoming self-aware at the moment of waking. It should come as no surprise, then, that in the incident related above, the boy's observation was verified by a dream. The direction of filiation, as Bachelard puts it, is from spirit down to corporeal beings, allowing the latter to be brought to life by the former. Bacon, had, this is, yeah, Francis Bacon, had he known about the case, would have been appalled. For us moderns, the direction of filiation is precisely the reverse, from the reality of living beings to their more or less fantastical apparitions. Thus, it is more usual and certainly more acceptable to require that dreams be verified by observation rather than vice versa. Uh, The idea, so that's kind of why I open with uh, Gabriella's account um, from being amongst the Maya of of how like the dream uh, form and a physical form have a sort of hierarchy where dream comes first, but they are different manifestations of the same, whatever it happens to be. So we're coming into the spirit contact is easy, um, I guess, epistemology rather than ontology. Because as we move into the book stuff, you'll see why that makes sense. Um, The idea of the book, this is back to Ingold, the idea of the book of the universe or of nature is of considerable antiquity and was uh, as current among medieval scholars as it was subsequently to become in the rise of modern science. Historian of religion Peter Harrison traces it to a number of contemporaneous ecclesiastical sources from the 12th century, uh, among them the Parisian philosopher, theologian um, Hugh of St. Victor, who, in his um, De Tribus Debus, Debus, sorry, um, it didn't copy-paste correctly, um, anyway, uh, declared that the whole sensible world is like a kind of book written by the finger of God. Um, the idea rested at root on a homology between um, word of God, verbum dei, in the composition of the scriptures, and the works of God in the creation of the world and its creatures. The question was, how could humans read those twin books? Um, with this, we can return to the monks of the medieval era, for whom, as I have already observed, I'm just not in the quotation that we're giving you here, um, the meditative practice of reading liturgical texts was a process of wayfaring, which is a term that uh, the premium members in particular are familiar with. Um, Again and again, they would compare their texts to a terrain through which they would make their way like hunters on a trail, drawing on or pulling in the things they encountered or the events to which they bore witness along the paths they travelled. The word in Latin for this drawing or pulling in was tractare, uh, from which is derived the English word treatise, or treatise in the sense of a written composition. Uh, as they proceeded, the personages whom they would meet on the way and whose stories were inscribed in the pages would speak to them with words of wisdom and guidance to which they would listen and from which they would learn. Um, they were known as the voces or voces paginarum, uh, voices of the page, voices of the pages. Uh, indeed. Reading was itself a vocal practice. Typically, monastic libraries were abuzz with the sounds of reading as the monks, murmuring the voices of the pages, would engage with them as though they were present and audible. To read, in its original medieval sense, was to be advised by these voices or to take counsel, much as the old Ojibwe man uh, would have been advised by the voice of his mentor, the Thunderbird, if only he had caught what it said. That was another quotation. I'm skipping through a long article here, right? Uh, Surrounded by the voices of the pages, as the hunter is surrounded by the voices of the land, the medieval reader was a follower of tradition, traditio, derived from the Latin tradere, to hand over. Tradition meant something rather different from what it is commonly taken for today. It was absolutely not a corpus of teachings or codified knowledge, to be passed from generation to generation. The word was rather used to signify an activity or performance, uh, 
thanks to which it was possible, relay fashion, to carry on. The scriptures, far from giving content to tradition, laid down the path along which this movement could proceed. Each path, each story, would take the reader so far before handing over to the next. The resemblance of the Latin tradere to the English trade, which is or trad, uh, which is derived track, is accidental, however. As theologian Peter Candler suggests in a commentary on the writings of Thomas Aquinas, the monk's calling was as much a trade as a craft. In his encyclopedic survey of animals in myth, legend, and literature, Boreas Sachs says that to study a tradition is to track a creature, as though one were a hunter, back through time. Each creature is its story its tradition, and to follow it, at is, uh, to follow it is at once to perform an act of remembrance and to move on in continuity with the values of the past. Often, the name of the creature is itself a condensed story, so that in its very utterance, the story is carried on. But it is carried on, too, in the calls or vocalizations of the creatures themselves, if they have a voice, uh, as well as in their manifest visible presence and activity. Uh, as a node or not in a skein of depictions, a skein of depictions, stories, calls, sightings, and observations, none more real than any other, every creature is not so much a living thing as the instantiation of a certain way of being alive. Instantiation of a certain way of being alive. So we're kind of looking at the notion of a thing, be it a bird or whatever being instantiated as a physical flesh, this is me now talking, right? Like uh, a flesh and blood organism, as well as a picture on a page, as well as a dream encounter and so on. Each of which to the medieval mind would open up a pathway to the experience of God. So it was too with the letters and figures of the manuscript, which according to Isidore of Seville, Seville, who is the patron saint of the internet, by the way, writing in the seventh century, enable readers to hear again and retain in memory the voices of those not actually present. Thus was the book of nature, written by the finger of God, mirrored in the nature of the book, read with the finger of man, a second nature comprised not of works, but of words. For Isidore, reading should be done quietly, but could not be altogether silent, since it depended on gestures of the throat and mouth. The manuscripts of the time were normally copied in scripto continua, that is to say, with no spaces between words. The only way to read, then, was to read out, following the line of letters with the fingers, while murmuring with the lips, much as one would follow a line of musical notation, and allowing the words to emerge or fall out from the performance itself. In the 12th century and early 13th centuries, however, there was a gradual shift towards reading with the eyes alone, unaccompanied by voice and gesture. What made this possible was the division of the line of text into word-length segments, each of which, which could be taken in at a glance, with spaces in between. This removed the need to mouth the letter line or to retrace it with the fingers. Medievalist and paleographer Paul Sanger um, has shown how, with such visual reading, the voices of the page were silenced. As long as everyone in a monastic library was reading aloud, the sound of one's own voice would have screened out the voices of others. But when one is trying to read silently, the slightest sound can be a distraction. So it was that silence came to reign within the cloistered confines of the monastery. In the world outside the monastery, however, in lay society, oral reading continued to predominate well into the 14th and 15th centuries. As historian of cognition David Olson has pointed out, it was the Reformation that heralded the key transition in ways of reading, from reading between the lines to reading what was on them, or from the search for revelations or epiphanies to the discovery of one true meaning lodged in the text and available to anyone with the necessary key to extract it. So you see there, the, um, there's almost a technological pivot, right? To a dumbing down to a single meaning from what was before a, um, a, an encounter. So that's where we lose something that would have looked familiar to a Maya daykeeper where um, the owl has, has a spontaneous meaning and it, as it appears in either a dream or your life as an interaction and foreboding and message or not even message, uh, meaning or message is all right, I guess, of something about to happen to your family. That was a, it's an encounter. It doesn't conflate and, and shrink down. And, um, and it was sort of, and Ingold goes on in the article, we're moving into the final little bit of the quotation. Um, it was with Luce, Luther and the Reformation that, um, 
preceding the Enlightenment, that we start to see the kind of complete collapse of words down to single meanings. And there's, there were political re- reasons, clearly, um, why uh, the Protestants did that, of course. Um, by focusing on the text, you, um, you de-center the uh, Catholic Church's sorts of, of uh, apostolic power, being that they have the throne of St. Peter and, and so on. Um, if you just make it all about the text and the single meaning of the text, you take away the literal magical power that... Um, the Catholic Church declared that it had built itself on, right? So we're going back to the um, Ingold piece now. Scripture for the Reformers was to be read not figuratively or allegorically, but as an authoritative record of historical truth. Uh, Nor should this record be tampered with. The book that had lain open in the medieval scholar's hands or on his desk, affording endless rereadings and retellings, and ever receptive to the insertion of glosses between the lines or in the margins, was now packaged as a complete object bound between front and back covers and lying closed upon the shelf. So too, nature was to be regarded as a closed book, a book already written from beginning to end, whose secrets could be prized out only through rigorous investigation in which every discovery represented not so much a revelation as a breakthrough. And that is just dropping out of the quotation again. Um, That's literally how we describe in, in science journalism the discovery of a new species um, as, as, or, or um, a new treatment as a breakthrough of something that is already pre-existing. And so the, um, we're, we're, this is what I mean by don't base it in models of cognition because the models of cognition come from this idea. Um, you have to step it back up into a world where these things and, and ideas and, and um, depictions on a page are manifestations of, of a thing that's real. Um, and, and you get more into that interactivity uh, revelation mode of being. And, uh, and that's what I mean by spirit contact being easy. Uh, anyway, back to the quotation. I have shown how, for medieval readers, meaning was generated in the vocal gestural activity of reading out. Doing and knowing here were as clearly coupled as chewing and digestion, an analogy explicitly drawn in the ancient characterization of thinking as rumination. To ruminate, we still say, is to chew things over, as cattle chew the cud, and to digest their meanings. Moreover, medieval people, as we have seen, would have read the Book of Nature in the same manner, through their practices of wayfaring, reading the voices of nature, of the more-than-human world. People were advised by them, and would follow this advice, in parallel with their own experience, in laying down a path. With a sensibility attuned by an intimate perceptual engagement with their surroundings, they could tell not only of what has been, but also of what will come to pass. Thus, knowledge of nature was forged in movement, in the course of going about in it. This knowledge was performative in the strict sense that it was formed through the comings and goings of inhabitants. Reading as performance, in short, was both word-forming and world-forming. As the case of the Ojibwa and the Thunderbird clearly demonstrates, in a, way of no- in a way of knowing that is performative, that goes along, any boundaries between self and other, or between mind and world, far from being set in stone, are provisional and fundamentally insecure. So that's the end of the, that's the, end of the quotation. And one of the things I'm, I enjoy so much about Ingold's work is that um, if you look back at, say, the kind of let's just call it version one or Western magic 1.0 in the 20th century, the the kind of delusional and fantastical idea of going back to like a, a, a pre-Christian, I don't know, like uh, Celtic utopia, even though they're all cutting off heads and it was as terrible then it is now, blah, blah, blah. Um, what we actually find is the, um, the break, the, the thing that made, uh, the sort of child cultures of, of Northwest Europe so damaged and, and damaging to the world isn't that far back. <laughs> really only, you know, 350 years or so before. Um, that's when we lost the ability, I think, to, um, to look at other life ways and other cultures in, in the eye. Uh, I think we were, I, I don't think it was that long ago. And that's the good news piece. This is what I mean by spirit contact is easy. It's not something that has been... Uh, you know, drummed out of us for like over millennia. It's not that far away. It is right there because the world and 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 you. This is why you base it in, in personhood, right? Um, you extend personhood beyond the human, and all of a sudden, uh, the universe gets far more crowded and far less lonely. 
Well, that's sort of what I mean by spirit contact being easy. So for the premium members, these excerpts and um, the video that, depending on when you listen to this, you may have already seen, will fold into the next Mansion Game discussion. Uh, and for everyone else, thank you for your patience, I guess, in not only the fact that this episode was delayed, uh, but also letting me get these thoughts out of my head in a way that is approaching coherence. I was going to say in a coherent um, method, but we are wayfaring or hunting this idea through books and podcasts and text, right? And at the moment, it sits at an overlap for me between the permaculture stuff I've been helping out with um, these past few months, but most especially these past couple of weeks, and my regular magical practice and my looming adventure and, and all of those things. So it's sitting at that overlap point. And I hope some of it was useful, um, or at least food for thought um, for your own, wherever you happen to be in, in thinking with spirits and the world and so on. I'd love some feedback from people who maybe haven't heard about that medieval style of um, reading and, and plan to experiment with it. And I don't mean like collapsing all the spaces between words, although you could, and, and read along with a finger. I just... what. Typically, when uh, it comes up in conversation, I'm usually talking to like a giant book nerd who has been waiting, and I, I tell them about this is what Ingold, this is how Ingold describes um, a medieval uh, writing, and and whoever I'm talking to, he or she's eyes will get like really big, and it's almost like um, they've been waiting their whole life for the permission. Um, to like read in an extreme way or to recognize that sometimes they have been because I think for people who listen, people who are interested in magic, I mean, you, you've heard me talk, give a couple hundred people the weird kid question, right? The majority of us are very much made by books early on and, and throughout life. And, uh, and we know they're magical, but like they actually are. Like if you, if you base yourself in a, in a decolonized philosophy, they are. And, um, and so it's, uh, I hope that is food for thought for you book nerds out there, that you, you kind of have an intellectual or philosophical permission to read in such an extreme way, or to recognize that you have historically read in an extreme way, right? Like, as with dreams, that decolonized animist approach instantly drops you into, a, a, again, like a far less lonely and, and, and a more enriching world. So that's... Um, Actually, this is technically the April solo show, if I, if I count back, and it's the end of May. So I will do a couple more to catch up. Uh, I'm not sure how reliable the releases are going to be over the next few weeks while I'm traveling, obviously. Um, there'll certainly be blog posts and social media updates on Twitter and the RuneSuit Facebook page and, and all of that, so we can definitely stay in touch. Um, there'll also be coming up some updates on a few New York events uh, and workshops I'll be doing in early September. I can't quite Describe, we're still doing venue stuff and whatever. Can't quite describe it yet, but keep your eye out for that. As ever, the premium members will hear about it first. Um, so premium members, look out for those emails. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's, I was about to say, this month slash last month's solo show. Until next time. 